So we're talking, you know, about community. We've talked about mission. We've talked about the church. We've talked about identity. Um, and, and so I just want to just kind of tee it up and have Sean um, Patterson come and talk. But I, I want you to just think about community for a minute because that's, you know, there's so many buzzwords that get thrown around in culture and society, you know, that we assume everybody knows what we're talking about. But when you talk about a community, when you talk about a kingdom community, uh, as the Bible defines it, you know, it really is talking about, it's to a compound word, you know, calm and unity is, you know, together with unity. Everybody say that together. Together with unity or a common union. And when you think about that, I, I mean, I flash over to Ephesians where Paul says that we were all baptized into, by, into one spirit, into one Lord, into one church, into one faith, into one hope. And then he calls for unity. So it's that, it's that union right there that, that we're a part of. And so uh, as, as community, but how many of you know that when you get more than two people in the same room, Christians or not, there's a potential for problems. People are going, yeah. We are a fellowship of difference, aren't we? I mean, we really are. And, and, and somehow God, by his spirit, knits people together uh, and then accomplishes his mission with, you know, just weak people that we all have, you know, hurts and hangups and dysfunctions and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, as I think about the fires, once again, I, I thought Kylie said it really well. Don't overthink it. Don't underthink it. But as I think about that, I thought in, in two, three, four years, you're going to hear stories of people that survived and people that lost everything. And when they interview them, when they talk about them, I guarantee you're not going to hear people talk about, well, when it happened, I, I just sucked it up. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I was self-reliant, self-sufficient. You know, I just went out there in my own grit, my own strength, and that's how I persevered through that crisis. You're not going to hear that from anybody. What you are going to hear is, you know what, there was people that came out of nowhere. There was Christians. You'll, you'll hear people referred to as angels. There was an angel named, and you'll, and you'll, hear, you'll hear this, but nobody will say they got it all put back together by themselves. It will always be the intervention of community and the, and the body of Christ. I'm telling you, when I, we've got to train ourselves with them when these crises, which aren't subsiding, by the way, I believe, you know, when, you know, in 1 Timothy, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. This planet's not going to get easier, so... Just know, the call will never be greater than it is today and tomorrow and the next crisis and the next trial and the next war and the, and the next, all, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I mean, I just, I just think about the pressing need for the body of Christ to step up and step out of the building and engage with the brokenness of humanity without any fear, without any intimidation, but with the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, you think about this, and this is stating the obvious, but, you know, this whole design of community is by God. It's not by us. Genesis 2, verse 18. You remember, God has, has created and, and taken a step back after every aspect of creation, and God saw that it was good, and God said that it was good. And you see this multiple times. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. He creates man, and for the first time, he says, very good. This is very good. And then for the first time, God says something very foreign. He says, Something's not good. And what's not good? It's not good that man is alone. And then what it got? God responded to that not goodness of the aloneness of man with a creation. Now, we tend to want to go right after marriage and say that's all about marriage. But I'll tell you, it's more than that. It is about marriage, but it's also about relationship. It's also about connectedness. And when he said it's not good that man is alone, he, he's, he's saying it's not good that man is isolated and separated. Think about when Adam named all the creatures. He named them how many by how many? Two by two. I wonder if at some point in all of the, you know, the created things, if Adam just didn't say, you know, there's two of them and 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 two. There's only one of me. I wonder if it was at that point that God didn't say, it's not good that man is alone. That alone means to be separated, isolated, like a branch that's severed from a tree. And so it's not receiving life. It's not giving life. Uh, it is dying slowly. And when he says in Genesis 2, it's not good that man is alone. You know, think about how ideal and perfect everything was for Adam at this point. 
I mean, I want you to just think about the perfect life that he had. He was created by God. Literally, God breathed the breath of life, and Adam became a living person. That's perfect. Think about it. Perfect. God breathed. He had the perfect family. I mean, think about what family did you come from? The Trinity. What's your family of origin? The Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy. There is no, nothing more perfect than that, than the Trinity. But that, that's how Adam was perfect. He had the perfect image. He was made in the very image and likeness of God. He was in the perfect environment. He was in Eden, not Cadavadera. Eden, perfect. Couldn't, you couldn't even improve upon it. He had the perfect job description. Take dominion over all this. I mean, perfect. Everything he had was perfect. He had no in-laws yet. <laughs> perfect. No, not, it's all good, but God said it's not alone. And to be alone is to be vulnerable. And, you know, you don't even need to dig hard to find that if a person is isolated and alone, the health risks go up in every aspect of our being. Yes. To be alone is to be vulnerable. Let me say this. God has a perfect plan for your life. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Perfect. The devil has a perfect plan also. It really does. Got a perfect plan. See, Jesus, in the midst of everything that he was doing, at one point said, every kingdom, every city, and every household divided against itself cannot stand. It's not even a maybe. It can't stand. Where there's disunity, disagreement, and division, there will always be collapse. And so that's why the enemy loves to separate and divide and get people whispering, get people gossiping, get people to uh, not deal with whatever the offenses are. And you know, we stuff it and stuff it, and then it comes out really ugly and really messy. Um, I have some friends that were, and I use this story with permission, and I'm going to have Sean come up. But they were missionaries in New Guinea out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, jungle, 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 out in the middle of nowhere to this tribe and two families, two couples went there. Okay, now think about this. You only have four people that speak the same language in the middle of a, a, a whole foreign, foreign, foreign culture. I mean, just out in the middle of nowhere. No cities, not just villages of tribal people. And they're assigned by God to go there and translate the tribal language on paper to get them the gospel. So the enemy... Of course, and they, this is what he told us. It was, it, was, it was incredible. He goes, this is how the enemy works. He goes, there's only two of us there. My hut was closer. Our hut was closer to the river. Uh, the other people, their hut was a little farther up the hill. And they had gotten there four months before them. And when people would come off the river, they would go by our house, our hut, and go up to our friends' huts. And he said, over time, I begin to get very jealous and very, he was being very raw, very real. He goes, I begin to be very jealous. And then it turned into anger. And then it turned into, we didn't talk to each other. Now, these are people that are on the same team, supposed to be doing like one of the greatest works of all time. And there's this anger and hostility. So the one guy, he said, so what I did is I bought some popcorn and I started bribing people to stay at my house, my hut. Now, just think about that. And it got to the point where the, the tension was so thick. Their desks were in, in a room to, by themselves, and they wouldn't even look at each other. They wouldn't even talk to each other. And then one day, finally, he said, I just can't, can't take it. And he went and he talked to his friend, and he said, I got to confess. I've been angry. I've been jealous. And the other guy said, I feel the same way. I've been angry. I've been jealous of you. Now, let me just tell you, if two people are angry and jealous each other, it's not, it's not God, right? You get that. It's the devil. And so you know what they did is they humbled themselves. They asked for forgiveness. They got back in unity. They got back on the, the same page. They translated Genesis to Revelation in this tribal language. And, and he said that the work took off exponentially when we reconciled in our hearts face to face to each other. That's what community is supposed to do. Sean Patterson, come on up here. Let's give it up for Sean. How you guys doing? I'm good. 
good? So we are in this series, uh, we're redefining church. Um, I would say, you know, just as I was looking at this, um, when we look at identity, community, and mission, um, it's, it's really not so much a redefinition, but it's actually more clarity, it's clarifying. And I say that because as you look at, um, you know, how Jesus operated, um, you know, this is, this is the DNA of discipleship. Identity community. This is not this kind of modern, creative way to talk about church. No, this is, uh, this is exactly the way Jesus operated. You look at uh, Jesus uh, to his disciples in Matthew chapter 4. as He's gathering disciples to begin his public ministry. You see uh, Jesus say to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Okay, follow me, community. I will make you identity, fishers of men, mission. You see that? You even see after he is crucified and he, he uh, rose from the dead, uh, Matthew 28, uh, verse 19, he says this then. He says, go and make disciples of every nation, mission. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, identity, teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you, community. And so th- this uh, idea of, of community, and really all three of these are, are, are vital. They're really, really, really important. These are the DNA of discipleship. And so as we're talking about community today, um, what's, what's funny to me as I just sat down to think about this is, you know, when many of us think of community, it has kind of like Pastor Bob said, it has kind of become the kind of this buzzword, right? It's this thing that we hear. And maybe even when you, when you hear it, maybe you're at a point now where you just start to even roll your eyes, okay, community, right? It's this idea, okay, we get it, we get it. Right. And and in some ways, I think even in our culture, we look at this idea of community groups and getting in community. It's kind of this either or. Right. It's like, well, you go to church, but you probably should add maybe a community group to your life. You know, that's kind of how we we think about community. Uh, but but I'm here to tell you uh, that community is vital. It's really important. I, I just figured maybe we need to define this a little bit. I, I like definition. So uh, this is a definition I came up with. You know, take it earlier. All right. A Christian community is simply sharing a common life in Christ. Its purpose is to move us beyond the self-interested isolation of private lives and beyond the superficial social contacts to a commitment of our lives together as the people of God. That's community. It's living our lives together as the people of God. That's what it is. Um, as uh, worship was going on this morning, Tracy said something. Um, she said, what does it look like? For heaven to come. Did you guys hear that? So what does it look like for heaven to come? And I was uh, gripped by uh, one of my favorite movies uh, ever is Remember the Titans. All right. And there's this, this scene in Remember the Titans. If you don't know what that movie is about, basically in the early 1970s, there's this football team that's an integrated football team. There's a lot of uh, pressure uh, as it relates to segregation, racial issues that are going on in this, in this community, really in, in the nation in that time of the world. And this football team is integrated. They're black and white kids. They're playing football together. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on them to win and to do well. And uh, the two highlighted players in that movie, if you've seen it, is they're two linebackers, right? And, and one's white, one's black. And so as she was saying that, what does it look like for heaven to come? I just got a vision of that scene in Remember the Titans. Um, and uh, Bertier says um, to, to Camel, he says, I was afraid of you, Julius. I only saw what I was afraid of. And now I know I was only hating my brother. And then he responded, and remember, the, if you've seen this, they're in the, the hospital. He had just uh, wrecked his Camaro. He got hit, and basically his football career was over. Um, and then uh, Camel says, this, he says, I tell you what, though. When all this is over, me and you are going to move out to some neighborhood together, okay? And, and we're going to get old. And we're going to get fat. And there ain't going to be all of this black and white between us. That's community. Like, can, can, I, can I get old and fat with some people? <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. Like, like can we kind of push back, push through all the, the pressures, all the things that, are, that make us different? 
but, but can we just do life together? Can we really get real? Can we get in each other's space together? Um, I invited some friends over. I, I, uh, Amy and I felt like it was really, really important for us to just go for it. And so we just gathered a few families and said, hey, we're just going to start doing life together. And so I invited a group of them to come over to watch the football game uh, this past Thursday, Packers and Seahawks. We just wanted to sit down and watch that. But uh, my schedule got kind of messed up, and so I was an hour late to my own house for having people. Now, if you know me, you're not shocked, like, at all by me being late even to my own house, but it happened. And so I walk in, and as I get in there, I see everyone at the kitchen table, and they're playing cards, and they're enjoying their time. And it was just glorious, and it was beautiful to me. It, it, was, it was amazing. Now, I really wanted to watch the, watch the football game, but they were playing cards. And so it, it was interesting to note that, you know, we were close enough for them to come over and eat my food, but they wouldn't put me in the card game, but that's another story. <laughs> but I'm sitting there, and I'm watching the football game as they're playing cards at the table, and I'm like, man, this is beautiful. And I just want to confess to you guys, it, it kind of took a lot for Amy and I to get there because, you know, we got four children. Like, to keep our house clean is literally an act of the Lord. <laughs> and, and so one of the first things, and sure, surely someone else feels this way, when we think about inviting people over to our house, first thing we say is, whoa, 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 uh-uh, our house isn't clean. Don't have people over. And we've just decided, forget it. We just said, you know, we're just going to let them in. And listen, we're being healed of this. This is something we're still <laughs> trying to figure But But the funny thing about it is as they walk into our house and as they walk into certain rooms, it's very interesting to note that they didn't go in those rooms and say, hey, you know, you guys, you guys clean up pretty nice on Sundays when you come to church. I, I'm really shocked that your room looks like this. <laughs> no, what they've said is, oh, yeah, I mean, that's our house too. You know, it's, I mean, we're so the same. And, and it's so freeing to see people that are that way. Uh, and so when you think about community, you know, every, every washing machine has an agitator, doesn't it? Every washing machine has an agitator. For your clothes to get clean, you've got to put it in this machine, and you need something in that machine that will knock the dirt off, that will shake the dirt off. This is what community is. You need people in your life who are agitators. You need people in your life who will literally shake you. Shake you. And so one of our problems with our very individualistic culture is, you know, what we want to do is we want the water of the word. Right? And we want to go through the motions. And we come out the other end and we walk around thinking we got it. And really, people look at us like, I mean, you stink. Do you have people in your life who will shake you, who will push your buttons, who will get you clean? Because if you've made a decision that you are only going to put people around you who are convenient to you, if you have this consumerist type approach where as soon as, you know, someone tries to just invade a little too much, you cut them off, you will not get clean. You won't get clean. And so one thing I just want to talk about in the few minutes I have uh, left here is, you know, my observation as I just sat down, I wanted to really try to uncover why are we so reluctant to engage? Like, really, what makes that so hard for us? What makes that difficult for us? And uh, I want to take you guys to a story, but I felt like I had to set that up because this story has really, you know, nothing uh, to do with community, but I, I want to point some things out to you uh, because I, I really wonder if we give enough credit or concern to what's wrong with us. If we are reluctant to engage with people of God, if we're reluctant to grow with the people of God, if we are avoiding community, I, I really believe that it's symptomatic of a deception in our hearts. And I want to explain this. I want to explain this by looking at Genesis chapter 4. So in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, I'm going to sit down in your chair, Bob, if you're all right with that. Getting comfortable here. Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve, they give birth to twin boys, Cain and Abel. Cain grows up and he is a farmer. Abel grows up and he is a shepherd. And the time came where they went to the Lord to give him an offering. And 
Scripture says that Cain gave God what he could afford. Abel gave God his best. He gave God the first fruit of his flock. God accepted Abel's gift, and he did not accept Cain's gift. And what you see is that Cain became inordinately upset about it, very upset. The Bible says that his countenance fell, that he became dejected, so much so that God had to actually go up to him. He had to pull him aside and say, hey, you're, you're really angry. Why are you so upset? You know that if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. But if you don't, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is to have you. And you have to subdue it and, and overtake it. We all know the story from there, right? What happens? Cain goes out and he still murders his brother. But I want us to, to take a moment and think about this. If a face-to-face pep talk from God wasn't enough to tease out and to root out what was going on in Cain's heart, why is it that we believe that one Sunday service, one sermon every week is enough to crowd out what's wrong with us? Think about I mean, where, where do we get that from? You know, if I just go to church, you know, I'm going to... What? He had a face and face encounter. God told him straight up what his problem was, and it wasn't enough. God uses a metaphor when he's talking to Cain. I just want to look at that for the last few minutes that we have together. God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching at your door. And there's two things that God is communicating to us with this metaphor. I want to share that with you. Number one, sin always hides itself. Sin always hides itself. To crouch is to get low, right? Uh, To crouch is to hide so that you cannot be seen. And I just want you to know that our sins will always appear to us less serious and smaller than they are. And the more you isolate yourself, the more you will believe that. This is one of the reasons Amy and I, uh, we really have a passion for family and marriage. And so we've... um, Spent a lot of time with married couples. We've done some premarital counseling. One of the things that we tell couples as they are going to get married is you get married and the uh, disillusionment is coming. (laughs) And when it comes, don't run. Don't hide. Because that's, that's, that's really how it happens, right? Like you spend, your parents spend all this money in this wedding. You make all these promises before their parents and your parents. You flew grandma and grandpa in. (laughs) Made all these promises. And then disillusionment comes in. They're not the person you thought you married. And and the thing we like to do is isolate. We don't want anyone to see this. And so we hide. When in reality, all across this room, we've got couples who can look you in the face and say, you'll be all right. And so what we tell couples is, hey, man, if, you know what? If, if you isolate, if you get yourself out on an island, it's dangerous. You get yourself out on an island and you become cannibals and you start trying to eat each other, right? Like that's, that's, that's what happens. You need, you need community. We need community. Sin always hides itself. Apart from community, Jesus can be my savior and principal while other things maintain functional title in my heart. Um, Rocky III, um, I was watching a scene of this the other day. In Rocky III, at the, at the end of the movie, he's having that epic showdown with Clubber Lane. And Rocky employs this strategy that even as someone watching the movie, and you know Rocky's going to win, right? But even watching the movie... He decides he's going to just let Clubber Lane just have free shots on him. And this is like the last round of the fight. And Clubber Lane, is a, he's a big brother. okay, And he is just hooking right, left, right, left. And he's just taking the hits, taking the hits. And he's making fun of him. And he's putting his hand on his. I mean, he's just doing all this stuff. And he's taking all these hits. 
And Apollo Creed, who in Rocky III, they became friends, and he actually helped him train for the fight. He's ringside with the other trainer, and he says to the other trainer, man, he's, he's going to get killed. And the other trainer says, no, 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 he's not going to get killed. He's getting mad. I just want to confess something to you guys. When I'm getting owned by sin, if, if I'm honest... I don't really allow myself to get as mad as I should. I just don't. I don't allow myself to to really get bent out of shape about it. Cain became angry, and uh, he became murderously angry, but not all anger is sinful. And the furthest extent of anger is hatred. And can I just tell you, can I just tell you that hatred is a relationship that Scripture tells us we need to have with sin. You will never destroy what you don't hate. And so when I talk about our reluctancy, all right, our reluctancy to engage, um, our our desire to avoid community, I I really wonder where we are with the sin that's in our own hearts. Because the question is, do you believe that sin is crouching at your door? Do you believe it? Because I submit to you, show me someone who avoids community, and I'll show you someone who doesn't believe that sin is crouching at their door. Show me someone uh, who believes they can do this Christian life on their own, and I'll show you a person who doesn't believe the sin in their heart and in their life is as powerful as it actually is. Because here's the truth about us. Even us as believers, even as believers, there's still a little Cain on the inside of us. And so that means we have to be far more intentional about our Christian growth and about prayer and about accountability to other people to overcome our bad habits. We can't just glide through the Christian life because there's something inside of us that still fights it. And so where are you on this? If someone wants to come, we're going to pray in a minute, but, but I really want to challenge us with this idea. Are you reluctant Are you avoiding community? You know, I heard uh, someone say that, um, a a general in in the army, he said this, that one of the worst things you can do in the time of war is underrate your enemy. Jesus died for this. Right, he died for us. He died for you, yes, but he died for us. And he wants to use community to really massage out all the things that are in our hearts, all the things that are keeping us bound. He wants to do that. Because here's the reality, Jesus Christ is the better older brother, right? He is everything that Cain wasn't. Because while sin was crouching at Cain's door, and as sin is crouching at your door, Jesus Christ is the door, yes. right? That, that he is the way of salvation. He is the way of protection. And though we struggle with uh, subduing and mastering sin, and Cain struggled with subduing and mastering sin, Jesus subdued and mastered sin when he died on the cross for us. And though Cain Uh, lied about his knowledge and responsibility for his brother. Jesus knows us and took responsibility for us. While Cain was cast out and cursed for his sin, Jesus was cast out and he took the curse of our sin. Cain became a homeless wanderer, scripture says, but Jesus became a homeless wanderer in order to bring you and me home. Do not, do not, do not decline the very thing that God wants to bring into your life that will help you grow. Because if you do, you'll walk around and you'll reek. You won't know it. Everyone else will know it. You'll reek. You know, one of the things that, um, that you know, I think we have, to, we have to own as a church is that our world right now can't really agree on much. Is that a fair statement? Like we're really having a hard time agreeing on things. 
and like biblical Christianity and the gospel, okay, it, 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 it handles that. But here's the problem. We as a church really, really struggle in this area of community, and I believe it's because of that that we don't really even have an answer. Like, this should be our superpower. Like, the world should be coming to us saying, hey, like, you guys are so diverse. You guys, don't, you guys have so many things that are so different. So, but, but they should be sitting at our feet trying to figure out how to do relationship well. This is us. God wants to do some things in you through community, but you got to let him. You got to throw yourself into it. It's not going to happen if you don't do that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that in Jesus Christ, we've been brought into fellowship with you. I thank you that with that fellowship with you, God, you have put people around us who are not like us. And that was by design. Because our diversity is the very thing that makes us, that gets us clean. The fact that we were different from each other and the fact that we don't agree on everything. Listen, agreement is not the highest form of unity. It's just not. So we don't have to agree on everything, but I will love you. And I just want to know, like I said earlier, is there anyone in the crowd, is there anyone who wants to get fat with me? Because that's what I'm after. That's what I'm going after. Lord, help us. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to great lengths to bring us close to you. So help us, Lord, to get close to each other. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank Sean. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Let's stand up. I love it. I lose 34 pounds, and he says he wants to get fat. It's like, great, man. Here we go again, right? Think about Proverbs 18.1, New King James Version says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise counsel. Mm, yeah. Hey, there's going to be some people that are up here ready to pray for you. So if you need prayer, hey, for whatever, come on up here, man. There's some people that really love you and care about you and know God and love God. And they will pray for you and the rest of us. Uh, if you're new, uh, Connect Sunday starts right now upstairs. You're dismissed. I love you, church. Have a great week.